Anyway, uh, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Premier, I, I hate that I have to continue to pester you about this, but you and I made a deal two months ago. She says I don't. Then, then I think you know where I'm coming from. I've asked the same question almost every day. Uh, two months ago, you and I agreed that we'd clear the decks on some secondary bills before the House in order to give you a chance to bring forward a jobs plan. Uh, I want to remind you, Premier, that there are only about eight days left until this legislature rises for the Christmas break. I've asked you day in and day out where your jobs plan is, as you promised. Unfortunately, on Monday, you brought forward your long-term energy plan, a continuation of Dalton McGuinty's failed energy policy. So I'm asking for a jobs plan. You gave me a job loss plan. Premier, we can do a loss plan in this. Will you bring in a jobs plan before you, legislator, you rise the House before Christmas? When's your plan come? You see there, please? You see there, please? Premier? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I, I really want to just uh, go to the premise of the uh, of the leader of the opposition's question because when he said we had that conversation about moving pieces of legislation ahead, that's exactly true. The second part, which is uh, uh, he uh, basically asking us to adopt his plan was never part of the conversation, Mr. Speaker. I said all along that we had a plan. We needed, uh, we needed to move legislation, legislation through the House, but we have a plan, Mr. Speaker, and I've spoken about it many times. I've talked about investing in people. I've talked about the skills that people need and making sure they have those supports. We talked about investing in infrastructure, and it would be great if the, uh, if the opposition would join with us in uh, strategic infrastructure investment, including transit and roads and bridges, Mr. Speaker. And I've talked Answer. about creating a business environment. And at the, uh, the manufacturers and exporters meeting last night, Mr. Speaker, it was very clear that the plan that Thank we've you. got in place is one that they support. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, well Premier, I, I, I didn't clear the decks for the good of my health. Uh, I did it so you could bring forward a jobs plan, as you said you would. Now, you could take our plan. I welcome you to steal it. You could take Don Drummond's plan. You could take Roger Martin's plan. I don't care what plan you take, as long as you bring forward a plan to grow our economy and put people back to work in the province of Ontario. Here's the question I have for you. We've lost 300,000 well-paying manufacturing jobs, and as you know, Premier, that pace of loss has accelerated under your leadership. If you do get a job in the province of Ontario, the odds have doubled that it's a minimum wage job. You said when you became Premier that you wanted to create a fair society. Premier, what is fair about creating society with public sector haves and everybody else working for the minimum wage? Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think that the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, I think we, we understand that his plan would include slashing services to people, Mr. Speaker, taking tens of thousands of people out of uh, the services that they deliver to, uh, to people, in, to residents of Ontario, to citizens in education and health care. But, Mr. Speaker, as I said, we have a plan in place. Part of that plan is creating a business environment, a dynamic business environment, so that businesses can thrive. And part of that strategy, Mr. Speaker, is the Small Businesses Act, which will come back from Very committee here. today. My hope is that the uh, PCs would work with us to pass the bill before Swinging the House guys, rises, Mr. Speaker, so that 60,000 businesses can benefit from that break on their payroll tax. Answer. I hope that the leader of the opposition would see that that is part of a plan Absolutely. to create jobs and support business and that they would help yeah, us move yeah, that you. legislation through. Final supplementary. Uh, the, um, I, don't, I don't think the Premier is, is getting a fair enough grasp on the reality that families are facing across the province of Ontario. Uh, minimum wage jobs have doubled as a proportion of the workforce. We've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. I, I know that facts are stubborn things, but they, but they are reality. And, Premier, the concern I have is that you continue to give more giveaways to the government unions with wage and benefit increases that they don't dream of in the private sector. 
The vast majority of jobs that we've lost in manufacturing were private sector union jobs. So how do you justify it to the union worker who used to work at John Deere, making good salary, who's maybe working at a part-time minimum wage job, that his taxes have to go up to pay for your giveaways to the government workers? How do you justify it to the Heinz worker, a union worker who's lost his job, that you're going to give more giveaways to people like Chris Mazza? It's not fair. It's not just. It's no way to build a fair society when you have public sector haves Thank and you. everybody else. My plan will grow more jobs across the economy. You need Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, what I hear from the Leader of the Opposition is wedges being driven between people, Mr. Speaker. What I hear is division being sown among people who have certain kinds of jobs, people who, have, who don't have those kinds of jobs. What I hear, Mr. Speaker, is a plan to slash public services, to take people out of public service in education and health care. And we're not going to do that, Mr. Speaker. What we believe is that it's very important to make the investments that will allow business to thrive, Mr. Speaker. And it's very interesting that the Leader of the Opposition talks about low wages, Mr. Speaker, when his policy, his labour policy, his so-called right to work policies, Mr. Speaker, would actually drive wages down across the board. It would be a race to the bottom. And that is not where we're going, Mr. Speaker. That is not the kind of Ontario that we envision on this side of the House. You see it, please? New question. Actually, the Premier, Premier is it back to the Premier Speaker? It's pretty basic rule of economics. You increase demand. You have more people who want to set up shop, more job careers in Ontario. That means wages rise. That means that middle class incomes increase. More people working the private sector. You don't seem to grasp the basic premise of economics. And I'll ask the Premier, is her plan working when the wages for Heinz workers are going to zero? When they've gone to zero for John Deere? When they're shipping Camaro from Ontario Order. to Michigan, Equinox from Ontario to Tennessee? Premier, your plan is bankrupting our province and it's hollowing out the middle class. We can do better than this. And I ask you, Premier, what is fair about society where the only job you can get is a minimum wage job? You're the one that's divided our province. You're the one that gave unaffordable increases to some and tossed the rest out of work. My plan to grow the economy, put people to good jobs, Question. workers back in business, to actually have a rising tide for all so we can protect the things we care about. That's my plan. I just ask you, where's yours? Thank you. The member from Durham will come to order. The member from Northumberland will come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think that the, the Leader of the Opposition needs to look to the jurisdictions where the kinds of policies that he is espousing have been put in place, Mr. Speaker, and to see what happens to wages, to see what happens to the quality of life, Mr. Speaker, to see what happens to the, the general well-being of people who rely on services, Mr. Speaker, and their ability to uh, to sustain their families. So, Mr. Speaker, that is not where we're going. We are not going to pit people against one another. We are not going to slash services across education and health care and across government. That is not what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. We are going to work with the private sector as we have been doing, as we have been doing with Toyota, with Ford, with GM, with Green Arc Tire Manufacturing, Nutera, Pillar 5 in Arnprior, Lambton Conveyor in Wallaceburg, Mr. Speaker. We're going to work with the people of Leamington yes, as we bring them together and figure out how to make sure that food processing actually expands, Mr. Speaker. That is the the goal that we have set in place. That is our plan, and that is the, those are the supports Thank we're putting in place, Mr. Speaker. The question, the member, uh, supplementary, the member from Burlington. Here, here. Premier, a new survey from economic development consultants, development counselors, international, looked into American executives' views on expansion markets. 
DCI found that when companies look to expand a new jurisdiction, the two most important factors driving site selection are operating costs yep. and workforce quality. Absolutely. Prima, your government is driving skilled laborers out of province. Absolutely. Our energy prices continue to skyrocket. Taxes are multiplying. <laughs> Red tape is costing us billions every Absolutely. year. And you tell us that this is the new normal. What sort of message does that send to potential Mr. investors? Mr. Speaker, well, I know that the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment is going to want to uh, weigh in on the supplementary, but let's just talk about energy prices for a second, Mr. Speaker, because I think it's a very instructive area. And as I say, when I was at the uh, the manufacturers and exporters uh, meeting last night, there were there were some really high praise for the long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker, because what business is looking for is a reliable energy, reliable electricity infrastructure. That's what they said, and it's too bad that all the members here weren't there to hear that. I know some were. Mr. Speaker, according to the National Energy Board, shouting uh, somebody down, uh, the member from Cambridge would wait a minute so that I can speak. Shouting somebody down is not polite. Premier. I just, I just want to talk about uh, the from Stormont, rates, come to Mr. Order. Speaker, and industrial from rates. From so industrial, come to order. Industrial rates in Northern Ontario are among the lowest in Canada and lower than 44 American states. Member from Mr. Nipissing, Speaker. come to industrial order. Industrial rates in Southern Ontario Member from are lower than in Alberta, war. Michigan, New Jersey, California, and they're in line Member with states like New York, order. Virginia, and Tennessee, Mr. Speaker. So the in fact, from Simple Gray, our rates come to order. are competitive, Mr. Speaker, and I think it's, wor it's worth noting, Mr. Speaker, that when the Leader of the Opposition was asked if he could promise yes, lower rates, he said the answer is no on that, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. You told the CME last night you were going to be their cheerleader. They don't need a cheerleader, they need a leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. are one thing, but let's look at the reality. DCI environment come to decisions order. were driven by cold, hard data. Absolutely. They took governments to stop focusing on feel-good marketing and answer one simple question. Can businesses be profitable here? If there isn't a business case for investing in Ontario, businesses will bet on another market. Well-run businesses look for well-run provinces. Premier, do you really think that investors will overlook the fact that Minister your finance Rural minister Affairs come to order. can't explain how he's going to eliminate the deficit or that you have no plan for jobs in the economy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You see it, please? Premier? In employment. Just in my head, in my mind. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And when I talk to members of the CME, they tell me that they're sick and tired of hearing from the official opposition talking down our manufacturing sector because they're so proud, as we are, of the strength of this sector. And especially at a time when the CME and their members are trying to encourage young people in this province to join the manufacturing sector, to join the skilled trades, to become technical people and member from Chatham come to order. Manufacturing sector, especially at this vital time where we're trying to encourage them. The official opposition, they may not know this. I know they're being political and a lot of this discussion, but I don't understand why they continue to talk down a sector and discourage our young people from entering into a viable sector that has 700,000 people working in it today, which is uh, some of the best companies. And, and in terms of the investment potential as well, we have, we have the number one destination Answer. per capita for foreign direct investment. These companies are coming here. I wish you'd stop talking down this sector because it's so important to Thank you. Ontario's economy. Good question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Stop the talk, please. You see it, please? You see it, please? <laughs> New question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier, does the Premier agree that transparency and accountability in our electricity system are more important than ever as bills continue to climb? Premier. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I, I do, and uh, I have said many times that from the, uh, from the moment I came into this job, I wanted to open up the, uh, the transparency around the way we do business in terms, particularly on uh, siting uh, large en energy infrastructure. But, Mr. Speaker, I think that the, uh, the long-term energy plan speaks to that transparency and that, uh, that openness going forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Speaker to the Premier, last year the private nuclear firm Bruce Power missed a key deadline in their contract. And under the terms of the contract the government signed, Ontario ratepayers were entitled to a significant rebate in the price they paid for power. One estimate says the government could have taken $500 million a year off our bills. Why didn't the government enforce the contract? Premier. Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're very proud of the job that Bruce Power is doing in delivering nuclear across the uh, province of Ontario, as well as Ontario power generation. The contracts that we have uh, are on a regular basis because issues come up are subject to negotiations, Mr. Speaker. And our uh, our uh, people in the ministry Member of from energy Durham will come to order. Uh, deal Second with time. those in a forthright manner, Mr. Speaker, in terms of resolving issues that come up. Uh, if you look across the whole energy sector, there are issues that will come up uh, with power producers, with power consumers relating to price, relating to contracts. They're negotiated in an open, forthright manner, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, neither the Premier nor the Minister answered that question. Last year, the government said they had independent reports to back their decision. For over a year, New Democrats have been asking for details of those reports. And for over a year, the government and Bruce Power have refused to share details. The government passed up an opportunity to get a half a billion dollars back from a private power company. Why can't we see the details that justify that decision? Mr. Speaker, as I've indicated, uh, there are issues that come up in negotiation of contracts, Mr. Speaker. Sometimes they can be made public, sometimes they can't. What I will do, I'm a new minister uh, for the last number of months. I will look into the issue uh, and I will, I will uh, report back to the member uh, in terms of getting additional information on the specifics of this particular issue. I'd be happy to meet with the member. Thank you. New question. Back Member to from Premier. Toronto Danforth. Ontario's auditor already said we paid far more than we should have in the private power deal with Bruce. The government had an opportunity to dramatically lower costs and pass a half billion dollars in savings onto families and businesses. The government didn't do that, and they won't share the reports that would explain why. Does the Premier understand why people paying the highest hydro rates in Canada? might expect a little more transparency. Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the Minister of, uh, the Minister of Energy has said that he will uh, he'll work with the member opposite on the specifics of information that he is uh, that he's looking for. But it, it seems to me, Mr. Speaker, that this member in particular might want to make some statements on what he supports in terms of energy planning going forward, Mr. Speaker. Because the messages that have been coming from the party have been so conflictual, Mr. Speaker. They have not indicated what they support. What we know is they don't support nuclear. They don't support our green energy plans, Mr. Speaker. They, they, don't, they don't support investing in the, uh, in the refurbishment of nuclear. They don't support investing in the distribution Answer. of energy, Mr. Speaker. So I would have thought that the member opposite would have wanted to let the House know and let the people of Ontario know what the NDP Thank plan you. is. We we haven't seen that, Mr. Speaker. Two supplementary. Well, Premier, you clearly don't want to answer these questions. The government was pretty clear this week. They plan to negotiate additional private power contracts for the refurbishment of six more units at Bruce starting in 2016. Given the high cost and lack of transparency associated with the contract, can the Premier offer any assurances? to families and businesses worried about new costs and a lack of transparency. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the refurbishments will require procurement. And I would ask the member, uh, if he were standing over here, 
Would he tell the people who are going to compete for those jobs what the cost of the contract will be, or will he allow a competitive process to take place so that we'll have competition to lower the price and, and give value to taxpayers, Mr. Speaker? He continues to criticize uh, private power in this province. Mr. Speaker, we have a hybrid system here. And when they were in power, Mr. Speaker, the NDP uh, they signed uh, something like uh, nine contracts for gas plants, Mr. Speaker, which are still operating in this province. They were part of the hybrid system. The hybrid system is working. They generate not only Answer. good value for taxpayer, but the private sector is creating thousands and thousands of jobs in the energy sector, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Final wow. supplementary. Oh, Speaker. Speaker, Speaker. <laughs> Ontarians are paying the highest electricity bills in Canada, and they see a government that doesn't seem to care. They added a billion dollars to hydro bills in their ill-fated gas plant adventure in Mississauga and Oakville. They added over $100 million to hydro bills, moving ahead with nuclear plans that they were going to have to scrap in any event. And now people learn that the government could have pursued Bruce Power for billions in savings and decided not to and they won't share the information that would justify that decision. Does the Premier think that that's acceptable? No, Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I would like the third party to share with the people of Ontario uh, what their policy is on electricity pricing, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party has indicated that she will not commit to reducing power prices. The leader of the opposition has said he will not commit to reducing power prices. Power prices will continue to increase, Mr. Speaker. But if we want to look at what the National Energy Board has done in terms of research for everybody in this room, according to the National Energy Board, first of all, our plan is predicting over 20 years uh, an average increase of 2.8%. Alberta, over 20 years, is predicting 3.7 per cent. BC is predicting 3.0 per cent. Manitoba is predicting 3.2 per cent. Wow. Quebec is producing 3.0 per cent. Saskatchewan is producing 3.30. What is your percentage for your party? Tell the people of Ontario. Oh, wow. Your question, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, on Monday of this week, uh, the Minister of Health told us that she hadn't read the forensic audit report into Orange. In fact, she hadn't even opened the envelope. Yesterday, she told us it was the interim report that she read, but she hadn't read the final report. She denied that she intentionally withheld that report from the Public Accounts Committee and then said her staff on a spin mission to the press gallery to tell the press gallery that all of the information in that report had already been submitted to the Public Accounts Committee. Speaker, that is an intentional move on the part of this minister to mislead not only us, but the media. Um, first, order, order. The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Finish your question. You're on the last 10 seconds. Speaker, it's obvious we're not going to get the answer here, and so I want to put the minister on notice that I will be filing a motion with the Public Accounts Committee this afternoon to call her to Thank testify you. under oath Thank at you. the committee's next. next Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Speaker, uh, I look forward to that opportunity because I do think that the member opposite needs to get his facts straight, Speaker. On December the 21st, 2011, I learned what Dr. Mazza uh, took from the taxpayers of this province in a single year. A single year was enough for me. That was game, set, match, Speaker. I immediately called a forensic audit because I wanted to understand what was going on in that organization. Several weeks later, I received an interim report from that forensic audit team again. That was all I needed to learn, and that was when I that's when I sent that to the Ontario Provincial Police. 
that pol the police took it from their speaker. They are doing their job. Answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, it's very clear the minister has much more to learn, and that is what is really going on at this committee. Speaker, a, a motion was filed this morning to get that report that the minister did not read. What's at issue now is the minister's credibility and her competency. After more than two years of public hearings, after more than 50 witnesses, the most we can get from this minister is equivocation. Speaker, we don't believe the minister. Nobody believes the minister. And that's why we want to meet her in the committee room and have her testify under oath next Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock. Will the minister commit now to appear before the committee at 9 o'clock next Wednesday morning? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, I, I look forward to, uh, to appearing before the committee because I think it's important that committee members and the people of Ontario understand what's actually happened in this case, Speaker. I took immediate action when I found out one year's income for that doctor from the taxpayers of this province. I took immediate action. I called in the forensic audit team, Speaker. Within weeks, he was gone. The entire Member board was Stormont, gone. New leadership was in place, and the OPP were investigating. Member from Halton, Perhaps come to order. Perhaps the opposite thinks that uh, that wasn't enough. Member from Stormont, I tell you, second complete morning. Complete change at Orange, and I'm proud of the work that the new team at Orange is doing. Thank you. New question. The member from Timmins. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question to the member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Premier. Premier, since your announcement of your long-term energy plan this weekend, we've had a number of calls in my constituency, and I'm sure it's the same in other constituencies' offices across Ontario, that a 33 percent increase over the next three years in hydro rates is going to force people on fixed incomes to move out of their homes. I'm getting the calls now where people are saying, listen, I can't make ends meet as it is now on my fixed income. If my hydro rate goes up 33 percent and I know my property taxes are going up right behind that, I can't afford to stay in my home. Can you tell me why it is that you're intent on raising ra rates so high that people have to move out of their homes as a means to support themselves in retirement? Thank you, Mr. Mr. Energy. Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, um, this government has had three uh, primary uh, issues in the energy sector. Uh, we want a reliable system, we want a clean system, we want an affordable system. We get AAA plus on, on reliability and making it clean. We cleaned up the mess that was there. We've got rid of coal, and there are significant pressures on pricing. This new plan, over 20 years, will see an average of 2.8 percent. But in the meantime, in the short term, there are still pressures. We still have the 10% uh, the discount clean energy benefit, Mr. Speaker, and I spoke publicly the member from the Hamilton Mountain yesterday and a we'll number of people so encouraging tell her to stop. consumers to call their local distribution com companies to get Peak Saver Plus. The study has been in. Yes, that has proven to reduce consumption by 9% for individuals. They can call their distribution company. There's no cost. Thank you. They'll install it in their home, and they can reduce the price. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, you know that that doesn't wash with people back home. What people know is they get a hydro bill every month, and the hydro bill is going through the roof, and they're looking at you and saying, what, another 33 percent? I can't take it, is what they're saying. So here we have an email from a woman from Dryden who writes the following. And of course, my glasses are... <laughs> 
Isn't that hilarious? My glasses got stuck. Sorry. I have an email here from a woman from Dryden that writes the following. With the increase in hydro, property taxes and insurance, we've decided to get our home up for sale. We can't afford to live in here anymore on a $566 a month Canada pension and what my husband got in RSPs. People can't afford to pay. Why then are you increasing rates by 33 percent, knowing it's going to force people out of their Question. homes? Mr. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to understand what the uh, NDP voted against, Mr. Speaker. They voted against the Ontario Clean Energy Benefit. They voted against Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit. They voted against the Northern Ontario Energy Credit, the Low Income Energy Assistance Program, wow. and the Save on Energy Home Assistance Program. There are a significant number of factors that the people in Northern Ontario, in Timmins and Thunder Bay can access to reduce their rates, including using the Peak Saver Plus, which will provide an additional uh, saving for them, Mr. Speaker. If they use all of these benefits, particularly those people on low income, their rates will be reduced significantly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, in my beautiful riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell, the ability to work and do business in both Ontario and Quebec is an important part of the day to day business. There's a large amount of cross border trade between Ontario and Quebec, and my constituents view the towns on either side of the border as neighbours, as one region. Speaker, a Labour Bill on Mobility was debated earlier this session and was brought forward by the opposition. That bill was presented as a solution to interprovincial trade issues, but in fact, it would have built barriers between our two great provinces. Speaker, we all know that closing doors and putting up walls isn't the answer. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell us, minister, what the ministry is doing to help improve labour mobility between Ontario and Quebec? Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Glengarry, Prescott Russell, for his advocacy Good on his member. behalf of his, on his community, yeah. and especially in eastern Ontario, on this very important issue, Speaker. Uh, he and I both know, Speaker, the labour mobility agreement between Ontario and Quebec has meant more jobs, more investments, and more opportunities for Ontario workers in Quebec. Yeah, yeah. And, Speaker, we know that we have to work together to fix problems, not create new ones. Yeah. And that's exactly what we have been doing, Speaker. And a uh, few weeks ago, uh, uh, we held the first labour mobility agreement uh, roundtable in Ottawa. This event, Speaker, brought representatives from business, from Labour, there was Minister of uh, Labour uh, representative there, Jobs Protection Office, the Colleges of Trade and others to identify and discuss issues that are Answer. facing workers and businesses and to find solutions by working together, Speaker. The roundtable was a great success and it just shows the progress we can make when Thank we you. work together instead of working to Thank divide. You. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for your response. And it's, it's great to hear you and your ministry are taking concrete action on this issue. I know that my constituent speaker will be pleased to hear that we're working together with our partners for better results instead of working to build barriers that would only harm or prevent interprovincial labour mobility. Speaker, Ontario is open for business, and we know that many people came out strongly against the bill when it was before this house, house such as Dr. John Simcoe Green, North, the president of the Mayor of Construction Association, Jim Watson, and the Mayor of Ottawa, Richard Hayter, and the Eastern Ontario Western Quebec Building Trades Council. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could you please tell us uh, more about your roundtable and what the reaction was? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Much. Uh, uh, it, it was a very good and productive discussion. Uh, like I said, we had uh, representatives from uh, all sides uh, of the issues, and we were able to really talk about experiences, how things have improved since 2006. And one of the messages, Speaker, I heard very loud and clear that uh, both the business, the construction sector in eastern Ontario, and 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 uh, the labour do not want to build uh, a Berlin Wall between Ontario and Quebec. They want to make sure that we continue to work together to enhance the labour mobility 
Prosperity Agreement so that more opportunities, more jobs can be created for Ontario businesses yeah, yeah. and Ontario workers to work in Quebec. And uh, there, as a result, uh, we had a very productive discussion, Speaker. As a result, we have a good sense of where we want to move forward. We'll be working closely with specific sectors to address some of the concerns. And so when I do sit down with my counterpart from Quebec, uh, we can find uh, uh, proactive ways to enhance that agreement and create more opportunities for Ontario Thank businesses you. and workers. Thank yeah, you, Speaker. Thank you. A new question. The member from Leeds Grenville. Very much, uh, Speaker. Hi, good question. My question is for the Premier. Premier, we agreed to uh, clear the decks so you could finally bring out your jobs plan. But what did we get? Bill 91, Order. another dangerous economic experiment that you say will create jobs. It's a job killer. Premier, you made the same claim with the killer. Green Energy Act, and look what happened. You killed Order. thousands of well-paying manufacturing jobs across the province. And now you're about to do the same thing with Bill 91. And what's your logic? You say that imposing a half a billion dollars in cost to business to Member from Oldfield, come to order. green jobs. Premier, I have a simple question. Have you done any economic impact analysis whatsoever on how many jobs yep. Bill 91 will kill right. in the manufacturing and sector? And name the source. Name the source. You see it, please? You see it, please? No, no, it's not on. <laughs> Order. Minister of the Environment. On one hand, you have a critic getting up saying that uh, somehow the recycling level in the province of Ontario is not satisfactory. Exactly. We did widespread consultation with virtually everybody, yes. municipalities, the private sector, individuals, environment groups, put together, put together a piece of legislation which was subjected to a lot of discussion before it even came to the House, did analysis of uh, what the impact would be by listening to those who made the representations, and there is a broad coalition of people out there under the umbrella of the Ontario Waste Management Association who happens to believe that this bill is absolutely essential, and they're wondering why your yes, party your party having coming forward with a plan that resembles this plan very closely has now decided Thank you. for partisan political purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. I can't believe what he said. The general will come to order. I just order. want to point something out to you. The Auditor General reported that for every so-called green job that's created, four more are lost somewhere else right. in our economy. Right. But I suppose Here. you wouldn't know that because the Liberal government never did a proper economic impact analysis on the Green Energy Act. Premier, your reckless policies are driving jobs out of this province. And now we have Bill 91 a bill that will raise prices for consumers and kill well-paying manufacturing jobs. Right. Premier, in September, Heinz wrote to your government pleading to do an economic impact analysis on Bill 91, but they never got an answer, right. and now they're gone. Oh. Right. Premier, how many more manufacturing jobs are you prepared to send out of this province just so you can try another one Question. of your dangerous oh, this economic is, policies? This is <laughs> You see him, please? The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex will come to order. The member from Prince Edward, Hastings will come to order. When he gets to his seat, I'll remind him a second time. The minister responsible for seniors has found that magic moment again for me to bring attention to him. He will come to order. Minister of the Environment. Well, Mr. Speaker, one can always count upon the Conservative Party in this House to take an anti-environment stand on each and every issue there is. That's right. Every time. Right on. They were doing. If, if it comes to dirty air, they are in favour of it. If it comes to dirty water, they are in favour of it. If it comes to Order. 
I, I uh, have a feeling that some members are testing and all pass the test. Minister of the Environment, finish, please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have met with people from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of organizations, a variety of businesses in the province of Ontario who have made their representations. I have invited them when the bill gets to committee. If the member from Oxford party, will come to order. The, the member from party, Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Every piece of legislation it can exactly. before this House. I have invited those individuals yes, to come to committee to make their representations and to offer their amendments. That is something they have welcomed, and that is something I look forward to Thank you. with great anticipation. New question. The member from Brandon Gormald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, it seems unbelievable, but the fact is that when it comes to the Minister of Health's explanation for why she didn't expose Dr. Mazza's real salary, the explanation keeps getting worse and worse. The minister has stated that it was the responsibility of opposition MPPs and the media who, unlike her, we didn't know the figure, it was our responsibility somehow to ask for the figure. It's deeply concerning that after months of front-page headlines and as a result of a minister who is not doing her job, she's continuing to fail to do her job in terms of oversight. Will the minister admit that it was her job to expose the salary of Dr. Mazza and she is the one who failed to do so? Well, Speaker, as I said earlier, on December 21, 2011, I learned what Dr. Mazza took from the taxpayers of this province. That was enough for me. One year's salary, that was it. Game, set, match. I called in the forensic audit team, Speaker. I think that was the action that, uh, that uh, the member of the opposition would expect I would do. When the forensic audit report came, Speaker. Member from Renfrew, come to order. Read that interim report. The member from Renfrew will come to order. Just in case you didn't hear. Finish. I read that interim report. By that time, Dr. Mazza and his entire board were gone, and I referred the matter to the Ontario Provincial Police. That was the right action to take. That is the action of a minister doing her job, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the minister, yesterday the minister was playing games when it came to explaining the facts, and it seems that she's doing the same thing again today. Let's be clear. The full details of Mr. Mazza's, Dr. Mazza's real payout were only included in the auditor's forensic report. The forensic report had the full details of this, of this salary. If this report was never handed over to the committee that was studying this issue. It was only the minister who was given this forensic report. When will the minister, and the minister chose not to read this report. She admitted that she didn't read this report. When will the minister stop blaming everyone else and admit that it was her fault that we are again knee-deep in another scandalous story involving her ministry? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Um, I think it's important to take the time to understand that the information, what information has been provided to the committee, Speaker. The, the committee requested information. They received that information. They received uh, the answer to the question from the member from Guelph who wanted a list of all compensation paid to Dr. Ma Maza. That information was provided to the committee, uh, part of it uh, publicly available, part of it in sealed envelopes because it was personal information. That information was tabled a year ago, Speaker. Also tabled with the committee was the interim report, the report that I based my decision on when I called in the OPP. The Answer. committee has the information. Thank you. New question, the member from Vaughan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Education. Uh, I was pleased to learn yesterday, Speaker, about the steps that our government is taking to strengthen oversight of the province's unlicensed child care sector while increasing access to licensed, chair, licensed child care options for family. Speaker, I'm even more pleased to learn that our government has placed a priority on reforming a piece of legislation that hasn't been reviewed in 30 years. Over the last year, Speaker, we've all seen heartbreaking tragedy in my community of Vaughan within the unlicensed sector. 
Now, I understand, Speaker, that much of the proposed legislation is aimed at addressing oversight within the unlicensed sector that could help prevent such a tragedy from happening again. Speaker, through you to the minister, uh, can she please describe how this legislation will improve and strengthen oversight in this sector? Thank you. Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Vaughan for raising this important issue. The member is absolutely correct. This legislation is overdue for a comprehensive update. Speaker, that is why well over a year ago we began to consult with parents and stakeholders on how to update the legislation. I'm proud of this legislation, which was tabled yesterday in this House, that, if passed, will improve oversight in the unlicensed sector. If passed, it will allow the province to immediately shut down a child care provider when a child's safety is at risk. It would also give the province the authority to issue administrative penalties of up to $100,000 per infraction by a child care provider. It would also increase the maximum penalty for illegal offences under the Act to, from $2,000 in the current Act to $250,000 in the new Act. Answer. It would increase the number of children a licensed home-based child care provider can care for from five to six, and it would require all private schools that care for children Thank you. to have a license. Supplementary. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for her response. I also know that our government has already taken steps to improve the oversight of child care. These include a dedicated enforcement team to investigate complaints against unlicensed providers and the development of an online searchable database of validated complaints. Speaker, through you to the minister, uh, can the minister please share with this House why this piece of legislation is critical? and why it needs to move through our legislative process as quickly as possible. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Another excellent question from uh, the member from Vaughan. As the, as the member pointed out in the previous question, the current piece of legislation that governs child care, the Day Nurseries Act, was enacted in 1946 and has not been comprehensively updated since 1983. Speaker, that's 30 years ago. The legislation does not reflect the current needs of our children and parents. The Child Care Modernization Act Speaker would help transform the child care and early years system to better meet the needs of both the parents who use and rely on the system and the children who are placed in its care. Speaker, I was pleased to hear yesterday from both parties in the House their acknowledgement and understanding of the importance of this yes, legislation. Both of them seem to think we need this legislation quickly, and I hope that they will both support and help us to pass the legislation. Thank you. Question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Um, the question, Premier. Premier, as you know, I'm from Niagara. I'm proud of that. And while um, a lot of folks associate tourism rightly with Niagara, I'd argue from where I grew up that manufacturing has been the backbone, the, the strength, the fabric of our middle class. Niagarans would always make things, sell them to the states and sell them to the world. It made it a great place to live. Unfortunately, under your policies, believe it or not, Niagara, we've lost two out of five manufacturing oh jobs. Jobs that have been there before the Liberal government, now two out of five have gone. John Deere, Edsha of Canada, Red Path Sugar, DMI Industries, I sadly go on and on. I've got a plan to bring 300,000 well-paying advanced manufacturing jobs back to our province, including the Niagara Peninsula. I want to fight to rebuild that Question. class. But why do you instead persist on policies that are making Niagara's greatest export manufacturing jobs across the border? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the centerpiece of the plan coming uh, from across the floor is right-to-work legislation, Mr. Speaker, that would drive wages down, that would drive quality of life down, Mr. Speaker, and, and we're just not going to do that. The other part of his plan, Mr. Speaker, is to cut 
is to cut services across government, to take tens of thousands of people out of those services that in education and health care that are so necessary for people in the province. So, Mr. Speaker, we believe that if we make the investments in people that are needed, make sure that the, the skills training is available, the, the education is available, Mr. Speaker, so we close that gap between the jobs, uh, jobs that are available and the uh, people who are looking for jobs. If we make the investments in infrastructure, and I think that the, uh, the member opposite would agree that infrastructure is very important yes, to the Niagara region, and if we work to create that business environment like small, like passing the Small Businesses Act, Mr. Speaker, Thank we you. would make the conditions right for businesses Thank coming you. to the province. Supplementary. But, but, Trina, if you believe that infrastructure is the path of success, why did you kill the environment? Why did you end that project if you actually believe that new highways create jobs? You know, one of the first jobs um, I had was at Pratt Lambert. It's a paint factory. It helped pay the bills for school, for university. But we've seen the industry hollowed out. DMI Industries and Fort Erie, Jarvis Street, Pharma. That's hundreds of jobs that no longer exist. And in a small town like Fort Erie, where I'm from, that's a massive economic the impact. Minister of Training Colleges and, and Universities the will come to, to order. Take industrial land along the Queen Elizabeth Corridor out of commission. You said they couldn't create jobs there. You have two choices since you have no plan. You can take our plan. You can take the NDP plan, which is going to increase hydro rates, increase taxes, and bring in more red tape like Bill 91, which is going to cost us jobs. But for goodness sakes, pick a lane, pick a plan. Mine will bring jobs back to the province of Ontario, rebuild our middle class, Thank and make hope for those in Niagara who are losing. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. For your Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the plan coming from across the floor would precipitate a race to the bottom, which we are not going to engage in, Mr. Speaker. And when the, when, the, when the leader of the opposition talks about infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, we're going to build the right infrastructure. So in terms of, uh, in terms of new roads, we're not going to build new roads for the sake of building new roads. We're going to make sure that the corridors that are already in place are being used appropriately, that we've got the transit that we need, Mr. Speaker, that we've got HOV lanes, Mr. Speaker, and HOT lanes that are going to give people choices and are going to use the existing corridors to the very best advantage, Mr. Speaker. But the fact the fact is that the Leader of the Opposition doesn't support initiatives to clean up the air, Never he doesn't the support Carleton initiatives to clean to up water, he doesn't support initiatives to preserve land, Mr. Speaker, so building roads willy-nilly is consistent with his plan. That's not what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. We are going to make the right investments in the right parts of the province. The Minister of the Environment will come to order, and the uh, member from Lambton Kent Middlesex is warned. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, it's been a week since the Minister learned that Ontarians are having their personal health information shared with Homeland Security agent of the United States. My, my question is simple. How could this be happening? Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak to this issue. Uh, I spoke to the uh, Information Privacy Commissioner uh, yesterday, I believe, or the day before, Dr. Ann Kavukian. Uh, we spoke about this issue. I uh, agree with her that it is completely unacceptable that personal health information be shared in that way. It is contrary to our legislation, uh, PHIPAA legislation, Speaker. The uh, Information and Privacy Commissioner is looking at this issue, Speaker, and she and I have agreed to cooperate. But I think it's important, Speaker, to note that our ministry does not, in fact, even have that personal information. It is not information we collect, therefore it is not information we could share. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. I'm happy that uh, the Information Privacy Commissioner responded so quickly to my letter and, and is working, but Ellen Richardson was willing to take her story public, but my office and the Minister's office have heard from other Ontarians who have had the same experience, but they do not want further breach of their privacy. All Ontarians need to be assured that their personal information is never shared without their consent. When Ontarians see privacy crack in their health information, it is the confidence in the healthcare system that crumbles. I ask again, 
Can the minister explain to Ontarians how their personal information was shared with Homeland Security and assured all of us that it will never happen again? Mr. Speaker, as I said, the Information Privacy Commissioner is taking this issue very, very seriously. She is working to find exactly uh, the source of that information, Speaker, but I can say with assurance that U.S. authorities do not have access to medical or other health records for Ontarians travelling to the U.S. As I said earlier, Speaker, we do not have that information, so we could not share it. But I completely agree it's imperative that the Information Privacy Commissioner does find out how that information is being uh, provided. And that, Speaker, I think Ontarians deserve to know that their personal health information is kept private. Here, here. Thank you. New question. We're from Ajax Pickering. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. December is already here, and families are preparing for a holiday season. Common tradition celebrated by families in Ajax Pickering is going to their local market or store to buy a freshly cut Christmas tree. And being that this is Saturday, December 7th coming up, it is National Christmas Tree Day. Many Ontarians will be out this weekend looking for that perfect Christmas tree. I expect a choir to sing here. Here in Ontario, we are fortunate to, to live in a place with over 71 million hectares of forest with about 85 billion trees, including the balsam fir, a perfect choice for a Christmas tree. We have access to many options for Christmas trees here in Ontario. We encourage everyone to buy local. Speaker, can the minister tell us on how buying a local Christmas tree will help support jobs here Thank in you. Ontario? Mr. Natural Resources. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, member from Ajax Pickering for the question. And on a little lighter note, in the spirit of the season, I'm pleased to tell members of the House about MNR's Ontario Wood Program, a great initiative to raise awareness of the benefits of uh, purchasing a Christmas tree for the holiday season. When you're buying a locally grown tree, you're helping to support businesses and an economy uh, in Ontario that's very important to. Uh, to the province. There are about 500 Christmas tree farmers in the province, and there are over 1 million Christmas trees harvested uh, each year by these Ontario uh, tree farmers. The sales amounts to about $5 million annually in direct sales. Uh, it takes about eight to 10 years to grow an eight foot Christmas tree, depending on the tree species. When one tree is harvested, three are planted Answer. so that there's always a sustainable crop here. This is very important. And the continued uh, harvesting and planting of these trees is great for the environment. The trees are 100% uh, recyclable Thank you. and biodegradable, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Buying local is very important to my community. And I thank you and the minister for letting us know about the benefits of buying an Ontario-grown Christmas tree. Many of my constituents will be happy to know that buying a freshly cut Christmas tree helps support jobs. The minister mentioned that Ontario Wood Program was launched by the ministry. What is important is that a program like this helps to provide jobs year-round, not just at Christmas time. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how we and all Ontarians can support the Ontario Wood Program all year round. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And again, uh, thanks to the member from Ajax Pickering. Uh, this industry is so important to uh, Ontario's economy, and the Ontario Wood Initiative, launched by MNR in 2011, helps to bring greater uh, notoriety to the importance of uh, Ontario wood and uh, wood products. The program is designed to recognize the importance of this natural resource and encourage Ontarians from across the province to think about the benefits of buying wood. Uh, products locally. Ontario's forest uh, products industry is a significant contributor to the economy. Most recent figures show that Ontario Forest supports 180,000 direct and indirect jobs across the province, valued at $11.9 billion. Uh, it's a renewable resource that literally builds our province. Buying Ontario wood, uh, consumers are helping to support these jobs. They're helping to boost the forest industry, which has certainly faced significant challenges in uh, recent years. Less than half of 1% of Ontario's forests are harvested each year by law, 
and uh, they're Thank required you. to have a plan in place for harvesting. Thank you. New question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. As well, Minister, Thursday last again, I updated the House on the controversial four-day deer calls taking place in the Short Hills Provincial Park. Last week, you stated that there were conservation officers, Ontario Provincial Police, as well as MNR staff on site to monitor the call. In light of next week's Auditor General's report managing provincial parks in a cost-effective manner, what was the total cost to the taxpayers to just have 24 deer harvested in the Short Hills Provincial Park, where there's comparatively speaking thousands of deer are taken harvested province-wide in a cost-effective manner at no cost to the taxpayer? Uh, Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, pleased to respond to the question and uh, share some of the comments that uh, uh, were, uh, were made last week when the question was originally asked. And the member knows that this is about uh, First Nation treaty rights. The member knows that this is uh, the Haudenosaunee First Nations exercising what are uh, their traditional hunting uh, rights in this particular area, and there is a cost to ensuring public safety. Now, I would uh, say, and as I have uh, indicated publicly, that the uh, individuals in this area who are expressing concerns should be expressing their concerns directly to the federal government. This is a treaty uh, from the, with the government of Canada uh, with uh, the Haudenosaunee First Nations. Answer. Uh, the cost is estimated, and uh, the members uh, asked for uh, cost estimates where they're around $40,000 to ensure that there is public safety. Uh, this Thank is, you. Uh, you know, uh, Speaker, I would say. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, quite frankly, this is nothing less than the deconstruction of a sanitized memory. Minister, it was stated that there was a need to reduce the deer population of the park by 85%. Yet the cull rate is 80% less than that, the statistical birth rate of deer, meaning that the population is constantly increasing by 30% per annum. Minister, do these stats mean that the people can expect a cull to continually, annually, and to expect an, ended, an expanded cull in order to achieve the de desired deer population? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, this has uh, absolutely nothing to do with a cull. This is uh, a hunt that is taking place by the First Nations. They're exercising their treaty rights. Absolutely. The member knows full well. He's raised the auditor uh, as uh, issue in their report. I don't think the auditor is going to be uh, interfering in what are constitutional treaty rights of our First Nations, uh, and we're certainly going to be welcoming the report and uh, looking to uh, uh, implement any of the recommendations that uh, that would be appropriate to do so. The uh, cost is one that the province uh, is bearing with respect to public safety. It's important to ensure that there's public safety while this is taking place. Uh, public safety uh, is the priority, and uh, this hunt was conducted in a safe manner. I'm, uh, I'm, perhaps we should be considering sending the, uh, sending the cost and sending the bill, though, to the federal government, the RCMP, for the, uh, for the cost of this, and the member might want to take that up with uh, some of his uh, federal colleagues in Ottawa. Thank you. Question the member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. My question is to the Minister of Finance. In January, the municipality of Killarney highlighted concerns with the new impact valuation method for provincial parks that would negatively affect tax revenues to the municipality. The lands in Killarney, Lakeheads, and Headwaters Provincial Park, Killarney Provincial Park, and French River Provincial Park are unpatented lands and will become exempt from taxation. The municipality will see a loss in excess of 649000 in revenue, equaling one-third of their tax base. What is the minister doing to work with municipalities so that they are not losing much-needed revenue? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you for the question. I do appreciate the concerns that the member has raised. It's something that we are addressing as well, working closely with uh, the municipalities. As a member may also know, the parliamentary assistant to the Ministry of Finance has been working with MPAC to ensure that we do a proper review and protect the interests of the municipalities that are affected. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> 
Again, to the Minister of Finance, the MPAC evaluation system is wreaking havoc for communities across the province. The entire evaluation systems of parks were sprung on communities last year, which left them with shortfalls from previous years. Now the province is threatening to terminate payment altogether on unpatented lands, which would leave the communities with another huge shortfall. What is the province planning on doing with the unpatented provincial park lands, and how will the, this affect payments to communities? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's, I, um, I know that there's continued need to have an ongoing discussion with our municipal partners to ensure that we get some of these initiatives correct and that we're fair, especially with the unpatented lands, because even some of those municipalities recognize that the neighboring community is actually taking advantage of their uh, services and resources that aren't being funded by the unpatented land. So we've got to get fairness in the system, and I'd be happy to work with the member as well to ensure that the, the communities in the north and those rural affected communities are properly ass assessed and that we have a fair system for all concerned. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from York Southwestern. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Consumer Services. Payday loan companies are used by various people for several reasons, sometimes by persons in uh, desperate situations who need quick access to funds. These operations offer services that are currently not provided by commercial banks, but they do raise concerns when it comes to consumer protection, as I've learned from the experiences of many hard-working people in uh, my writing of your Southwestern. There are protections for consumers set out in the Paid Day Loans Act. However, many Ontarians are not aware of these when it comes to using a payday loan company. Mr. Speaker, my question is, what protections currently exist for consumers who use these services provided by these companies? Great question. Good question. Good question. Thank you, so, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from York Southwestern for raising this very important question. It's important to remember that it was our government in 2008 that brought forward one of the most comprehensive payday loans legislations in Canada, and we we did this very swiftly when this business was downloaded from the federal government. The Act provides tremendous number of protection to consumers, and um, it meets certain needs for consumers to have access to funds, Speaker. However, the industry has changed, and we know that there's a lot of technology involved with accessing payday uh, loans, and new products are being offered in this marketplace, Speaker. And that, uh, those are some of the reasons why I announced Answer. my review of the Payday Lending Act, and we're committed to supporting consumers and supporting our economy. Thank you, right. Speaker. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.